Well, welcome, welcome Trevor Buffs, alumni, faculty, students, um, and their families. Thank you for joining us this evening for this exciting installment of Forever Buff Spotlight Series. Spotlight Series programs um, highlights alumni, students, faculty, and staff that exemplify the Colorado Creed and make a positive impact in their industry or community. This program aims to build connections with the CU Boulder community that we are all a part of. For those of you watching on Zoom, if you are in need of closed captioning, please click the CC button located in the bottom of your screen. And tonight's event is brought to you by the CU Boulder Alumni Association and the Herd Leadership Council, our Student Alumni Association. Before I introduce our guest, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Zachary Mendelsberg. I'm from Parker, Colorado. I'm the spirit chair for the Herd Leadership Council and I'll be graduating in December with a degree in finance. Um, we are joined here tonight by Michael Sherman, Oscar nominated producer for the incredible film that we just watched, Hunger Ward. Michael Sherman is a CU alum who graduated in 1995 with a master's degree in telecommunications. His initial work in the film industry was on the set of Havana, Sidney Pollock's narrative on the Cuban revolution, filmed in the Dominican Republic in 1990. Subsequently, he spent 25 years in the tech industry, managing nearly 200 projects, most recently at Facebook. Inspired by the convergence of the technology and film industries, combined with his passion for the art of film as a catalyst for social change. Michael decided to partner with independent filmmakers on impactful film projects beginning in 2018. He assisted with the promotion of director Sky Fitzgerald's last film, Lifeboat, then went on to produce Hunger Ward last year and serves on the advisory board of the Bend Film Festival. Michael, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. Of course. And before we get into talking about you and how you found yourself as a film producer, working on these incredible and inspiring projects, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about Hunger Ward. And first off, can, can you just talk a little bit about what we just uh, watched? Yeah, the film we just watched is essentially um, these heroic female healthcare workers working against all odds to save the lives of the most vulnerable in Yemen, um, these young children. And it's just um, very difficult to watch, obviously, but there, there are heroes and there are heroic moments there. Um, we actually filmed in Yemen in January and February of 2020. So a year and a half ago or so. And only um, two people went in, uh, director Sky Fitzgerald and our director of photography, Jeff Ball. And they went in for 30 days. And as you could see, uh, they opened filming in the south of Yemen, which is actually the more dangerous part of the country because there's so many different groups fighting and no one's in overall control. Um, so they filmed in Sadaka Hospital um, with Dr. Aida El Sadiq, who's essentially the premier expert on severe acute malnutrition uh, in children in Yemen. It's called SAMS. And she runs or was running the ward there at the hospital. And we saw um, the life of Omeima, a 10-year-old child who only weighed 24 pounds when our crew arrived and filmed her. And then Sky and Jeff filmed there. And then they um, spent many hours moving to the north through 25 checkpoints to get into the Houthi-controlled area of the country, which is where 80% of the population lives, and film north of the capital um, in, at this network of 13 clinics founded by the woman that you saw, Nurse Miki Amaji. Uh, she founded it herself uh, over a number of years, again, focused on child malnutrition. And we followed Abir, um, the six-year-old who only weighed 15 pounds, just devastating. And then interspersed, interspersed with that was the bombing scene. This was cell phone footage provided to Sky by the, the man you saw there in the film. Um, who was an attendee at this funeral. And it was a funeral of the father of a government official. And right before the funeral started, um, the Saudi coalition dropped, you know, with the US assistance with our planes and bombs. And I'll explain the details a little bit later, dropped a, a bomb on the funeral. And it wasn't just a single, it's called a triple tap. So I dropped one bomb and then they waited for people to go in and start rescuing and taking out survivors. 
and then dropped another. And not only we saw two strikes and then there was a third strike and they, they wait um, and drop, you know, once rescuers go in and that's what we were able to see and showing you a little bit of the cause behind this famine. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like, you know, just end this, this question um, with a question that Yemenis asked our crew there um, a couple of times that has really haunted me and sat with me throughout this project. And it's, they asked, why do you feed us with your aid and then drop bombs on us? And can you just talk a little bit about, obviously there's a North and a South, but who are the parties um, at war and, and why are they fighting? Sure. Um, you know, we could do a whole semester course on the roots of this war and who's fighting. So I'll try and provide just a, a really quick overview. Um, and you can ask more questions later, but essentially there's the um, Saudi coalition, which includes Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the United States, the UK and France are the five primary countries um, with the US providing the majority of weapons and planes. Uh, but then there's 25 other countries in this coalition that have um, done, done this war to Yemen. Um, on the other side are the Houthis, who are a Shia group from the north of Yemen, and they're a moderate Shia group. Books I've read have said that the, they actually worshiped in the same mosques as um, the Sunni Muslims in their area. Um, and then they didn't begin with Iran's support, but as the war progressed, Iran stepped in and started helping them. Experts say that the Iran's assistance to the Houthis is way overblown, way beyond what the Saudis claim. And it's nowhere near this coalition of 30 countries that are doing this war to Yemen. And then in the South, and, and their primary conflict um, is in the North, which is about 80% of the, where the 80% of the population is. Then in the South, there's a bunch of other groups that are fighting. Um, the Southern Transitional Council, and they're related to the UAE. Um, there's um, ISLA, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, the Yemeni version of the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, uh, then other warlords and, and local uh, tribes that are fighting for territory, because many in the South want to break off and have South Yemen again, like there was before 1990. Um, the interesting thing is that the Houthis have actually been fighting Al-Qaeda. You know, so it's it's really a complex situation. But the main conflict is the Houthis against the Saudi coalition, which we're a part of, and our tax dollars are going towards. Um, I can provide a little more background on why they're fighting. I mean, why Yemen? If you want, I'll go into those details if you'd like. And I just don't want to bore you, and and just let me know. Um, so Yemen, if you don't know where it is, it's st very strategically located at the tip of the Arabian Peninsula, south of Saudi Arabia, shares a border with Saudi Arabia, and on the eastern side is access, you know, sea access up to uh, the Persian Gulf. On the western side is the Red Sea, and then Suez Canal, and so it's right on a major ship, one of the ma world's major ships channels from Asia to Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. So strategically located there. Also, they have oil, um, rich natural resources, mineral deposits, and Saudi Arabia obviously doesn't want anyone that's not friendly with Saudi Arabia to control Yemen. And also in the last hundred years with the discovery of oil in the region, uh, outside forces have tried to control Yemen for hundred years. And this is a current iteration of it. And it started after Arab Spring in 2011 when the dictator of 30 years was thrown out, he had to step down. Um, his vice president took over for three years, the new government, people weren't happy with it. They felt there was still the, the same amount of corruption, same amount of Saudi or other countries influence on their country. So the Houthis said enough, they marched south, took the capital very quickly in 2014, um, took 80% of the country very quickly. And so the president left, he went to Saudi Arabia, pulled this coalition together of the US, UAE, um, the UK to start bombing. And they started bombing in March of 2015 during the Obama administration. And um, our partner on the film, or one of our friends, he's a friend of mine, our family friend, who was uh, the White House chief of staff for President Obama uh, when this decision was made, whether the US would assist the Saudis. And he said the Saudis convinced them it was gonna be a two week war, two weeks of bombing. And now here we are seven years later and there's been um, 23,000 airstrikes on the country, 18,000 civilians uh, casualties. 
And it's an airstrike every um, 10 per day since the war started. And 250,000 dead overall. The other piece, which is even worse, all the Yemenis tell me, we can handle the airstrikes. What's worse is the blockade. And that has created the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, according to the United Nations. And that blockade is of food, um, medicine, and uh, oil. So they can't move goods around. They can't get food out to rural areas because the oil is cut off. And so that right there has created the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. UN provides continual statistics of 30 million people, 24 need aid to survive. 15 million are going hungry this year. 5 million are facing imminent famine and over 2 million children. 4 million are displaced within the country. Um, the hospital, the medical system is destroyed because of the airstrikes and lack of fuel. Um, economy is destroyed, farms are destroyed because the airstrikes hit hospitals, schools, farms, manufacturing, et cetera, in addition to military targets. So with that, um, after World War II when the G Geneva Convention were put in place, one part of it was you can't use food as a weapon of war anymore. That's a war crime because of what Hitler did throughout Europe. And that's what's going on here, is that it's an intentional starvation of a population and a destruction of an economy to starve people to death to take over the country. And unfortunately, and one of the reasons why I got involved with this project is because we're involved with it and we don't even know about it, most people in the West and in the United States. Thank you. And Michael, I was wondering if you could touch on how you first became involved with this project and what about this topic called you to dedicate so much of you and in, in your life to this? Topic. Sure. Um, I retired from uh, Facebook and tech uh, in 2018 and wanted to take some time and kind of figure out what I wanted to do next. I really wanted to do something creative and I'd worked on that film 30 years ago and thought, man, eh, maybe film. And also wanted to do something with social impact like what I was involved with in my early 20s. And so I went to our local film festival in Bend, Oregon, and I met two directors. Um, one, I'm good friends with him now. He lives in Bend. He's an outdoor filmmaker. And he said, geez, everything you've been doing for 25 years in tech, managing these projects is exactly what a producer does. And I said, really? He said, yeah, a producer does is what a project manager does in tech. So I said, oh, all right. And then I also met Sky and um, helped him a little bit, just a tiny bit on his last project, Lifeboat. And I was really moved by his work and the refugee trilogy that Lifeboat was his second film on. And so we, I did that for four months or so, just minor role. And then after that, we talked about um, the next film and he said he would like to do it on Yemen. He'd been doing research, talking to journalists and filmmakers throughout the Middle East. And Yemen would be the next best place to get, this, to get a story out of, of a tragedy that wasn't being told in the West. And so we started talking about it and uh, I did my research and again, yeah, this would be a project I'd like to work on. So we decided to co-produce it together. Two and a half, it's, it was two and a half years ago now. That's how I got involved. And just the, the humanitarian crisis that it's human caused and that we've been involved and we don't even know about it in this country um, was why I got involved, so. Thank you, and I, want, I was wondering for the audience here and watching at Zoom, what, what do you hope the film inspires the average viewer to do about the crisis in Yemen? And do you hope it creates as much action as it's creating conversation and thought? Absolutely. Um, we created this film to raise awareness in the West because we don't hear about Yemen in the media very much. Syria gets a lot of attention, Palestine, um, Libya, but not Yemen. And so we created the film to raise awareness and then to make it as a, available as a tool to the, the activists and politicians and influencers and journalists who are telling the story of Yemen and trying to get change to offer the film up to them and these other tools that we created with the film to uh, in their work to try and uh, end the war end the blockade and restore aid that has been drastically cut in the last two years with COVID to not only uh, keep people alive now but also help rebuild the country. And so with that, um, we reached out, we spent months and months and months reaching out to you many Americans who are very involved in the issue and there's been some great work done and we can talk about it in a little, if you want later, about what's happened on Capitol Hill. Um, and so we reached out to them for months and months and built a network of those who cared and wanted to use the tools. And when it came time to release the film was last October, nobody was hosting movie screenings here or in Europe. 
So we had to go virtual. And so we did um, with our Yemeni American partners that we got involved with through this outreach and other politicians and others, we did over 20 virtual events over a six month period starting in late October with Obama's chief of staff. He hosted the first one from Washington DC. Um, and then we did a bunch more. One of them was with the UN World Food Program who won the Nobel Peace Prize last fall. We did an event from the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, Norway with the head of the World Food Program. Uh, we'd show the, we showed the film and then people from over 60 countries, just like our Zoom here tonight, joined in, watched the film and saw the discussion. Uh, we did three more from DC and uh, Sky is actually a director, is heading to The Hague in the Netherlands in a couple of weeks to do a screening with U UN Human Rights Commission um, at the International Criminal Court and some other human rights organizations at the International Criminal Court. So it is being used and it is raising awareness and that's our intention of why we made the film, so. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael, I wanted to shift gears just a little bit and talk a little bit about your experience here at CU and see if there's anything that um, while you're a student that you can attribute to your career um, sure. as a film producer. Be curious to hear that. Yeah, at, at CU, um, CU is really important, absolutely, for getting involved with this project for me over this period of 25, 30 years. Uh, when I came to CU, um, my wife started college later and her best friend from college is here tonight. <laughs> they started down in Colorado Springs together. And so my wife was finishing up her undergrad and I was planning on going, getting a PhD in history. And I was really interested in US um, intervention in Latin America and wanted to get a PhD in history. So I was here while she was finishing her undergrad, I'm gonna do, since my background was in business and the humanities, I was gonna do some more history classes and then apply to PhD programs. Well, that all changed when I got here. Um, my advisor in the history department said, you know, there's only one job for every 200 history PhDs that graduate. Your chances of ever getting a job, you'll spend eight years, your chances of ever getting a job are pretty slim. Um, you know, you can have a global impact if you go over to the business school and do information systems and get involved with international things and study history on the side and make it a hobby. So I went over and talked with the business school and they said, this is in the first couple of months here. And they said, um, well, you know, my advisor there said, this is all great here in the business school, but next door, there's this thing called the internet that's coming. And it's gonna be big, we think. And CU has the biggest telecommunications program in the world. And it's the best place to go if you wanna get involved in this global movement of connecting the world. So I hopped over there and went to the engineering school and got a master's in telecommunications. Um, and from that, I built just a, a technical foundation uh, that went along with my background in humanities and business to do this 25 year career running projects and which led to this film. And you know, specifically technical skills that I learned here on the film, we had a number of problems and, that, and that's what you, I learned here in the technical or the, the, the program here. And my, my colleague from the program is also here from 25 years ago, is we learned how to solve problems with technology. This was 25 years ago. So on the film, we had a number of problems that we needed to solve with technical, with technical skills. One of them was we're sending two, two filmmakers into a war zone and they're filming every day, five different cameras. And I calculated there would be about 48 terabytes of film. And there's no way, and there's no very little internet connectivity in the country, a war is going on. The cell phone network, there's no way you could upload that stuff every day to save your footage. So we had to figure out a way to get it on hard drives and then not have those hard drives stolen, confiscated, um, or destroyed. And so we created three copies every night, created this whole hard drive system and three copies every night. One went with each filmmaker and then one was secretly hidden somewhere in the country that we did not disclose in case they were arrested, detained, kidnapped, or the footage was taken as they left the country. We always had a copy if we needed. So that was one technical problem. Another was how do we communicate with these guys when the cell phone network is not only monitored by the Saudis um, and different forces and could put them in danger and people in the film in danger, uh, how do we keep in communication with them in case they do get detained or kidnapped? And so I had done a satellite course here at CU and set them up with a satellite communicator. And that's how I was able to track wherever they were at all times. And he could, he could, they could text me via satellite very safely. And the last one was once it came time to release the film, um, we had to do this using technology. 
because we couldn't travel around the country and do screenings like we're doing tonight. And so we fig I, I did the research, we figured out the best platform to do these global screenings, which almost all of our screenings, people tuned in from 30 different countries per screening, um, hundreds and hundreds of people. And so we needed a platform that would provide people a viewing experience, uh, like just like we're watching in a theater concurrently all together and then pop over to a discussion. So that was another you know, technical solution that I needed. And my skills here at CU helped with all three of those, those things. So I really um, thank CU for that and, and the program here. And so Michael, after 25 years in the tech industry, when, when did you decide a career in the film industry was <laughs> right for you? And how was that transition from IT to being in film production like for you? Yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier that I met this guy in 2018 at this film festival. And once we decided to work together, I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. And 30 years ago, I had worked, I'd been working in the Dominican Republic doing um, development work and um, sort of humanitarian work and got stumbled onto this Hollywood set and worked on this Hollywood movie. And they offered me to work the whole film. I was only 23 years old, right out of college. And I had no idea what the opportunity was to be right on set with Sidney Pollack, this director. And, I turned them down because I couldn't handle as a 22 year old, 23 year old kid, the cognitive dissonance of eating lobster tail on a movie set one day and at night going home to where I lived where there was no running water. And so I told them no. And I always regretted that, that that was such a unique opportunity that I passed up. And maybe I would have been making human rights films much earlier if I wouldn't have done that. Um, but I did turn that down. So this time when the opportunity came up, I'm like, I'm gonna do it, whatever it takes. And so that was three years ago. Um, and I really found, you, know, you asked the question of, you know, what did I find about the transition? Surprisingly, film projects are very similar to the projects I've been running. It's just the product, instead of it being a software product or a network in the end of a project, is this, you know, this cinematic digital work of art that, needed to, that we needed to get out to the world. So the process to make it was very similar to the projects in the past. It was actually what I found very similar to a startup. I did a startup like six years ago. And the process is very similar to a startup. As a filmmaker, you get a vision, put that together in a pitch packet, and you go pitch your deal to funders to try and get funding. And then you have to build a schedule, bring the people in, manage risks, all the things that you do on any other projects, very similar. But I've developed a deep, deep respect for independent filmmakers, because especially human rights and humanitarian filmmakers, because these aren't commercial projects. This film isn't making, we didn't make it to make money. It didn't make money and they don't make money. And like Sky, our director, he has worked for years and years for nothing uh, to get these films out to the world. His last two were funded on his credit cards with just hopes that he would get enough funding um, for distribution of the film to pay his bills. And so, and they work thousands and thousands of hours to get these films out to us and for little or no pay at all. So I have deep respect for, for them after working on the project. So yeah, your, your different skills that you had picked up in different industries. I wanna, wanna touch again on if you can talk about moving across industries and ultimately how you discovered your passion. Sure. Um, right out of college, I took a job in business and right away knew my dad was at the same company for 35 years, wearing a suit and tie for 35 years. And I'm like, this isn't for me. And so I left and had to do some other things and went to the Dominican Republic and was gonna do the PhD in history, eventually ended up at CU here. Then after CU, um, I joined a small telecommunications firm. I didn't know it at the time that I would eventually be, be essentially a millennial before there were millennial careers because I'm a Gen X or I guess I'm the first or second year of Gen X. And I took a job with this small consulting firm in Minneapolis and right away they had me um, working managing tech projects in the financial industry. And then I became an employee of that company. It was American Express at the time. And uh, about a little while after that, my boss from the consulting firm called and said, hey, would you like to start your own company? I need someone right now, a consultant who can roll out a network to 500 Home Depot stores in four months and you can do it from your basement. And so I said, all right, that sounds great because then I could work for myself and take time off and be with my kids rather than just work all the time. So we did that project and that led to 18 years of running projects for large organizations in finance, higher ed, um, the airline industry, manufacturing, retail. And with each 
engagement, they're all just gigs. So I was a gig worker for 20 years, just gigs. Um, with each gig, we'd learn a new industry, um, new organization, new ways of how people communicate, lingo, how things work, and then take the best of those things to the next place. And um, so it was luckily, it was, it was very fortunate to have that opportunity and which eventually led to working on a film like this and hopping into the film industry and how the process of learning the lingo, et cetera. Um, and the other nice thing about it, and was really fortunate that I would take time off in between and my kids and I, we and wife, we drove around the West in a VW van and we did the van life in between projects. Um, so especially now, I think that's much more the norm and more expected. When I was in charge of hiring at Facebook, we were looking for people who had a variety of experience rather than just at one place and could learn to adapt and learn new cultures, new ways of doing things and problem solve in new environments very quickly. And that's more how the world works today. Um, you know, we typically stay at a place for 25, 35 years. And that's more what we were looking for was that dynamic um, uh, ability to learn and grow. So, well, and CU you. was a big part of that. So thank you. Oh yeah, Th thank you for, for sharing all, all of your experiences. Sure. And I'm sure we're all kind of curious, but what, what's in store for your future, Michael? And are you already working on other film projects or tackling humanitarian issues? We, we'd love to hear. I have a potential project on Vietnam, a film project, um, but I'm just like before, uh, this was the last six years for me have been really busy with a startup and then Facebook and then this film. So I'm gonna really just take some time off and um, figure out what's next. It might be writing, it might be making a film, it might be a combination of both, but I need some time to to slow down and um, reflect and figure out what that is and how I can make an impact and try and do something that'll that'll be for good. So thank you. And thanks for, thanks for Zach for hosting this and also to Haley and CU for hosting this. This is so important to us. This is why we made this film to get out to screenings like this where we can raise awareness of what's going on in Yemen um, to people who would know that this is going on. So. With all that being said, Michael, in our, in our last 15 minutes here, I'd love to be able to take some audience questions. Um, we have a, a Zoom audience, but we'll start with the in-person um, audience. And if we have any questions, just, yeah, we can get that, get the microphone passed to right up here in the front. So I guess I have two questions. One, how do you actually film in the hospital? Were the people, like, what, how big was the camera? How intrusive was it? How did the patients feel, the families? And that looked so um, difficult uh, yeah. to do that. And then second, what would a win be? How would the war end? Right, okay. So answering the first question, um, Sky, our director, is just, He's a genius at, at doing these kind of films. And um, he spent months and months building relationships from here um, to be able to access those hospitals and be a part of working with those healthcare workers. Um, his style of filmmaking he calls humanitarian cinema, um, which instead of you know most documentaries made in the US, it's talking heads with facts and um, um, just a lot of facts flying at you and talking heads. And, and instead he tries to do the opposite and that's put you immersively in the world of people who are going through these horrific tragedies so that we as an audience can feel what they're feeling and potentially then engage because our hearts are connected with what's going on. And cinema is just a beautiful way to do that. And Sky is, is one of the best in the world at doing that. And that's hence the Oscar nominations. Um, so, uh, as far as like getting access and filming, I'll talk first about um, getting access to the people in the film and how to sensitively do that. Of course, everyone agreed to be filmed. And then second, just the style of filmmaking. So first off, um, when they arrived at each location, they spent many hours talking, not only with the staff, getting agreement on filming, and this was agreed to ahead of time, but they also just talked through. And then each family um, they would talk to for a long time and get approval to film. Um, some families would say, no, we don't wanna be a part of it. And obviously they were never on camera at all. Uh, the, the families that you saw, they said, we want this story to get out to the world, especially the families who lost children before our eyes. Um, and it's such an intimate um, moment. So Sky 
is, I, I just hats off to him of how he does this. A, he didn't bring me. He didn't have a producer there running around. Didn't have a sound person. He only brings another um, director of photography. And he's a director of photography by trade. So they had two cameras. They brought five cameras. They had two running at all times. And they try and be, they, so they don't have boom mics. Um, everything was lavalier mics like what I'm wearing. Um, just so that otherwise it'd be very intrusive and wouldn't be natural and wouldn't be immersive. People would act differently and it wouldn't be respectful to what they're going through if this whole crew was gathered around filming them. Instead, they tried to sit back, back of the room with the camera, get closer when it's okay. Um, but there's nothing else. So it's, it's technically very simple. And they do that on purpose, not only for the safety of them, but for the safety of the people and the intimate moments that these families are going through. Um, what was the other? A win on, a win on the war. What, what kind yeah. of that would look Does like? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, the second is, and there, there were families that said, um, please turn the camera off now. And so they'd turn the cameras off and then they'd then later on said, okay, please film again. And then they would bring the, pick the cameras back up. Um, so a win on the war. Um, so what the Yemenis told us and what our Yemeni American partners who are working so hard for peace in our country, because if we can get the US government to stop support, um, those planes can't fly anymore. The blockade would be very difficult to implement without our support. Um, what they tell us is they just want the foreign powers out and that let the Yemenis figure out the problems themselves and which was almost happening before the bombs dropped. Um, so an end to the war is really critical, especially the foreign powers who are, are doing the war on Yemen. Um, and there are human rights abuses on both sides, on you know, the Saudi side as well as the Houthi side. Um, so that's the number one thing. But before that is an end to this blockade. Unfortunately, um, we met with the head of the World Food Program. He was calling for it, just saying this blockade's got to end because it's starving people to death. It's essentially a war crime. And there potentially are groups bringing potential war crimes um, against the parties involved because of that. So ending that blockade is what everybody has been pushing for on Capitol Hill, and then ending our support for the war. It's not gonna be easy because there's still other groups fighting in the South. And so experts are saying it's not just, oh, sign a peace agreement between the Houthis. Well, there's other groups that, that want power too. So it needs to be shared power, shared agreement, shared peace agreement. Does that help? There are a number of complications that you brought up. I apologize for this mess. <clears throat> it seems like that the lady who is in charge there was saying that the pillars, the pillars of uh, civilization, so to speak, in that area have been torn down. Yeah. And so, how? <clears throat> excuse me. I'm a horse. How do you track something like? what you're looking for, such as to improve the day-to-day -day life, save the lives, get food in there, stop the bombing, coordinate 30 different countries that all have their own reasons for doing this. Yeah. And money won't do it because money goes to the corrupt parts of the government. And yeah. at least in what I've read, not necessarily at Yemeni or Yemen, uh, but everywhere. So money sometimes does not provide a solution. So how can you track uh, improvement based on what your film does? And I know you've got a lot of Zoom members that are watching this tonight. So you're getting the story told, but how do you track any improvement uh, so realistically? The question is how to improvement just from the film or, or how do we track improvement in Yemen overall? Um, you know, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Yeah. The film is good. The production was absolutely tremendous. And the yeah. people that participated in this in Yemen, uh, it's heart wrenching to see it. So, but my concern is how do you track the actual improvement, feet on the ground, making a difference in their lives? What do they have to live for? The pillars are torn down. Even if they, the kids don't die, they've lost education. They've lost their standard of living. 
they've lost their agriculture. There is no business to be done. It, it's just tough. And can you track to see if there's any improvement coming down the trail? You know, that's, that's a tough question. Um, on a micro level, um, we can tell you that um, the film itself, you know, on our website, we haven't done a fundraising campaign, but on our website, we have a place where people can donate to the clinics to where we have a direct channel to get funds right to those clinics, to those healthcare workers that you saw, to feed families that come in and children that come in because these children have to be on special diets for years in their recovery. So um, we thought we'd raise maybe $10,000 because we don't do, a, we just have it up, we talk about it after the film. Um, $250,000, over 250 has come in and that money is um, going directly to those clinics. And the two children that you saw there because of that are doing very well today. They're recovered, they're back at home, they're thriving, and Sky has direct contact with the healthcare workers and those families. On a micro level, you know, that's one thing we can do, and we can each do our little part. On a macro level, societal level, um, I personally just track uh, the best stats come out of the UN and some other NGO organizations of the impact and the improvements and right now it's been getting worse and worse. Uh, I don't have the power ability to track in Yemen, you know, the economic recovery. Instead, I rely on experts and I follow what's going on. Um, but the main thing that everyone keeps saying is we, we need the war to end so that we can get back to rebuilding. Yemenis are strong. They've been fighting outside powers for decades and they can rebuild their country with our help, but the war needs to end and this blockade needs to end for that macro level progress to happen. And that's when we'll see a difference. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So I actually have a question from one of our Zoom viewers. Um, his name is Ryan, and he would like to know how you have used social media to increase awareness on this issue and to promote your film. Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned a year ago, when we released the film in October, social media was a huge part of it because we don't have the ability to do a theatrical release. So we used um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn to just continually get word out about the film and all these events. And because we partnered with so many organizations, we have the Yemeni Alliance Committee, the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, the IRC, International Rescue Committee, so our main partners, along with the um, Friends Committee or the Quakers on Capitol Hill, they're the main peace lobbyist on Capitol Hill, and they hosted two events with us. And so through all these groups, we've done a social media campaign over the past year. And the Yemeni Alliance Committee, who I connected with um, just over a year ago, founded in, in San Francisco by a Yemeni American woman, um, they have built a network of uh, 400 groups in the United States, 700 worldwide that are pushing for peace. And they have massive social media uh, impact outreach. And it was through that that we're able to get people to our events from 60 different countries, which we never expected. We thought, oh, maybe people from the US and the UK will join on these events. People from all over the world, every time we put one out, I'd see people from everywhere signing up to see this. And that was all because of social media. So it's been a huge tool and a big help. And a lot of the things working at Facebook, I really struggled with. And one of the reasons I left was, was um, some of you know, all their issues that they've had and things that, the scandals they've had over the last three or four years. One of the reasons why I left, but it was also a great tool to get word out about this issue. So it's a double-edged sword. And Michael, I think we have, have time for, for one more, for two more questions, actually. So we'll take our first um, audience question um, right there. Well, it appears to me you've got a civil war going on there, if I'm not mistaken. So you're going to have to clean that up yeah. before you can really get the big picture cleaned up. Yeah, it's a civil war, which then became an international proxy war. So Yemenis want the international proxies to leave. Um, that's what we've been told over and over again. And allow the Yemenis to work things out, which they have been doing. It's a 7,000 year old civilization. Yes, yeah. yeah, you know, and it's been around for a long, 7, long time. 7,000 years. You We're get to the north and the south fighting, get the rest of the guys out of there, let them have at it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, that's what they've been asking and what the experts tell us. But it's, it's very complex. 
and um, you know it's they're in such a strategic location that um, but yeah. We have, another, uh, we have another online question. Uh, this one's from David. How much did the film cost to make and has that cost been recouped yet? Um, yeah, I can't say an exact budget, but we were very fortunate this time instead of credit cards. Um, um, Paul Allen, who was the co-founder of Microsoft and he passed away a few years ago, but he has a film production company and they were our major funder of this project. Uh, unfortunately, they, during COVID, decided to shut down a 23-year-old uh, film division of Vulcan, Vulcan, which they own the Trailblazers and Seahawks. They've made over 100 films, but they um, provided funding so that we didn't have to do it off our credit cards, which was great. And so we actually were able to you know, make enough to, to cover costs, which was wonderful. And then when it came time for distribution this February, um, the woman who um, founded HBO Documentaries and now fund, or founded um, uh, MTV Documentary Films saw the film and said, I want to distribute this, I want to buy this. So she uh, took it on and MTV bought the film and they're owned by CBS and Viacom. So they put it out on their channels and have distributed it over the last six months and that's where you can watch it now. All right, so we're going to take one final question from the audience um, in the back. Hi, I just have like one question that I was wondering about. Um, the people that were filmed, did they get like anything in like, I mean like money or like food or anything since they were like getting filmed or something to help film this movie? Um, they weren't paid, uh, but they all agreed whether through a written, most of them uh, were, um, don't read or write. So they did a video approval, um, but through the funds that have um, come in, uh, those families have been getting food and food baskets to make sure that their children, because unfortunately what happens in a situation like this, they go to the, they travel hours and hours to bring their children there and um, spend it some, you know, as you saw the one father, they've sold all their cattle um, to, to get to the clinics and save the children, but then they go back home and don't have food. So then they're back again but for the children now that come in, there are food baskets provided by the Yemeni Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and funding uh, for food that has come in from the, the money raised from this film. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, yeah, we wanna respect your time and, and all of our guests here. Um, so I just wanna to, want to thank you for, for being here in Boulder and, and sharing about the crisis in Yemen. It's really important. And I just wanna also thank our audience here and on Zoom for for showing their support to, to this issue and also for all the wonderful questions. We're sorry if we didn't get to some more questions. I think we're gonna be hanging out a little bit um, with some refreshments out, out there, but um, I just wanna go ahead and thank, thank you again thank for you. being here. And lastly, I just want everyone here to keep an eye out for further for, um, Forever Buff Spotlight series. Um, you can visit our website to find out more about these type of events at www.colorado.edu slash alumni slash events. You can also follow our social media channels at C Boulder Alumni and at CUHLC. And I just want to thank all of our partners for supporting us um, together this evening. The goal of the event was to, to be able to obviously bring some awareness and be able to build and maintain um, our connection to CU Boulder here. And so we hope all of you stay connected to CU Boulder and uh, go Buffs. Can I say one final thing? Go for it. If you want to learn more or get involved, you can go out to hungerward.org. And the one page on there is called Get Involved. And there are some resources and organizations that we're partnering with um, to, to get involved. Or there's a page called See the Film. And you can see where it's streaming online on Paramount Plus or Pluto TV. And also all these events we did, um, we did with the New York Times, CNN, Trevor Noah, The Daily Show, um, some politicians, Nick Kristoff from the New York Times. Those are all out there if you want to learn more. They were great events. Some of them are just short clips. Some are, are full events. So please go out, check it out, and learn more. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.